let's start with chapter two of Totem and Taboo, called Taboo and the Ambivalence of Emotion. By the way, you'll notice that in this episode, I've deliberately skirted the actual topic matter of this small book. That is, the spiritual practices of totemism and taboo prohibitions in primitive cultures. In many places, Freud's discussion feels a bit more like an anthropological study than a psychological one. But briefly, for the sake of understanding the intersection of religion and the ambivalence of human emotion, totemism was a form of primitive religion that centered spiritual, cultural, and sociological infrastructures around totem animals. Taboo refers to the people, places, and things that these communities considered to be untouchable because they were dangerous, either because they were considered to be associated with wicked spirits, or, in the case of holy people and things, because of their jealous, punitive power. Relevant to this discussion is what Freud says about the use of sacred objects and ideas to placate our inherently ambivalent human emotion. He talks about the possible double meaning in the original word for taboo. He says this, and I quote, the double meaning in question belonged to the word taboo from the very beginning, and it serves to designate a definite ambivalence as well as everything which has come into existence on the basis of this ambivalence. Taboo is itself an ambivalent word. The taboo prohibition is to be explained as the result of an emotional ambivalence." End quote. Freud goes on to explain that the very necessity of a command to abstain from something is evidence of this inherent human emotional ambivalence. He says this and I quote, If taboo expresses itself mainly in prohibitions, it may well be considered self-evident that it is based on a positive, desireful impulse. For what nobody desires to do does not have to be forbidden. And certainly, whatever is expressly forbidden must be an object of desire. And if we should apply the same theory to those cases in which we ourselves seem to hear the voice of conscience most clearly, we would arouse the greatest contradiction. For there we would assert with the most utmost certainty that we did not feel the slightest temptation to violate any of these commandments, as for example, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, and that we felt nothing but repugnance at the idea." End quote. What Freud is saying here is that behind every prohibition is a desire, or else why would there need to be the prohibition in the first place? If nobody was ever motivated to do this deed, why would a prohibition against it need to exist? Freud then goes on to talk about what he has learned from performing psychoanalysis, and I quote, If we take into account the following results of psychoanalysis, our understanding of the problem is greatly advanced. The analysis of dreams of normal individuals has shown that our temptation to kill others is stronger and more frequent than we had suspected, and that it produces psychic effects even where it does not reveal itself to our consciousness. And when we have learned that the obsessive rules of certain neurotics are nothing but measures of self-reassurance and self-punishment erected against the reinforced impulse to commit murder, we can return with fresh appreciation to our previous hypothesis that every prohibition must conceal a desire." End quote. According to Freud, when faced with ambiguity on how to act because of the ambivalence of emotion, primitive religion provided a set of taboos to help settle the ambivalence this was then carried forth into monotheistic religion with its accompanying moral precepts. And even today, when faced with ambivalence and socially unacceptable desires, many individuals revert to a religiously prescribed taboo as a touch point to settle their ambivalence. And this is familiar in many religious traditions. In moments of great ambivalence, we're taught to beseech God for an answer. In my religious upbringing, as part of a high demand religious group, we were provided a database of everything that the organization had ever published. If members ever faced challenging life decisions, we could simply use the search feature to find a number of articles that would show us the appropriate course of action. Very rarely would you not be able to find an article that addressed your circumstances exactly. Freud's discussion also made me think about religious icons in broader religion. For example, why do we hang a cross around our rearview mirror? or place a figure of Ganesha on our dashboard? Well, it could be for several reasons. Perhaps it's pure superstition to avoid a car crash. It could be tribalism to let other people know where you stand on matters of religion. Or it could be an outward display of piety to signal to others that 
you're a good person, but for many, it no doubt serves as a reminder when faced with moments of emotional ambivalence. When we are, to use a religious expression, tempted or faced with indecision, we look to our totem, settle the ambiguity. The icon reminds us of the taboos associated with the religious tradition, and we know what to do. Ford goes on to talk about how this style of thinking can result in anxiety if a taboo is transgressed. And I quote, It is therefore probable that conscience also originates on the basis of an ambivalent feeling from quite definite human relations which contain this ambivalence. One component of the two contrasting feelings is unconscious and is kept repressed by the compulsive domination of the other component. The character of compulsion neurotics shows a predominant trait of painful conscientiousness, which is a symptom of reaction against the temptation which lurks in the unconscious, and which develops into the highest degrees of guilty consciences as their illness grows worse." End quote. So when someone represses their unconscious desire to violate a taboo, they experience a high degree of guilty conscience, and anxiety that left unchecked can lead to any one of the conditions that could be called what Freud refers to as compulsion neurosis. This leads us to the second main point, the omnipotence of thought, a phrase that Freud admits to taking from another author. He says this on page 72, and I quote, The existence of omnipotence of thought is most clearly seen in compulsion neurosis. In every one of the neuroses, it is not the reality of the experience, but the reality of the thought, which forms the basis for the symptom formation. Neurotics live in a special world in which, as I have elsewhere expressed it, only the neurotic standard of currency counts. That is to say, only things intensively thought of or effectively conceived are effective with them, regardless of whether these things are in harmony with outer reality. A compulsion neurotic may be oppressed by a sense of guilt which is appropriate to a wholesale murderer, while at the same time he acts towards his fellow beings in a most considerate and scrupulous manner, a behavior which he evinced since childhood. And yet his sense of guilt is justified. It is based upon intensive and frequent death wishes which unconsciously manifest themselves towards his fellow beings. It is motivated from the point of view of unconscious thoughts not of intentional acts. Thus, the omnipotence of thought, the overestimation of psychic processes as opposed to reality, proves to be of unlimited effect in the neurotic's effective life and in all that emanates from it." End quote. No doubt, Freud's language here is condescending. He goes on in the same paragraph to compare compulsion neurotics to the savages of primitive cultures. But he does touch on a reality for many religionists, and that is that they feel intense anxiety and guilt over transgressions that never manifest in reality. In another place in the book, Freud says this, and I quote, when we examine these neurotics for the deeds which have called forth such reactions, we're disappointed. We do not find deeds, but only impulses and feelings which sought evil, but which were restrained from carrying it out. Only psychic realities and not actual ones, are the basis of the neurotic's sense of guilt. It is characteristic of the neurosis to put a psychic reality above an actual one and to react as seriously to thoughts as the normal person reacts only toward realities." End quote. 